In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our sermon this evening comes from our gospel lesson, uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 42. Judge not. That is a little phrase from not only our uh, reading tonight, but also from Matthew 7, 1. And it has been a verse used quite a bit in recent years uh, when it comes to calling out what we in the Christian world understand as being sin, whether it be abortion, whether it be homosexual marriage, whether it be euthanasia. Uh, the idea of judging behavior has become a taboo subject especially in a country such as ours where we believe that the individual is in charge and ultimately the arbiter of his own behavior judging is seen as something that's very uh, very hierarchical very uh, very authoritarian and the funny thing is is that when you talk about not judging, you go on to social media, that's kind of when that verse goes away. Uh, you can see how people can be very vicious on social media as opposed when they're talking to you face to face. Uh, whenever you uh, may have a differing opinion on that platform, uh, you could be greeted with all sorts of four-letter words and all sorts of attitudes, uh, be it positive or negative. But if you were to say something that goes against a particular opinion, you could uh, go undergo the uh, Internet's version of manslaughter. Uh, it is that bad. We tend to say not judge as far as it comes to us, but when it comes to other people, it's okay. But for the Christian, there's, you know, as I've read in preparation for this sermon, one person actually brought up a very good point. There is a fine tension that we walk as believers in what it means to judge. Obviously, there is judgment in the Bible of all sorts. We are called to uh, ex actually uh, a little further into Matthew 7 from that verse that everyone likes to quote. Jesus actually says you can judge a person by the fruits that they bear. Um, the New Testament is rife with uh, the Christian church needing to judge its own people, in particular in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, where Paul in the one says that you must judge uh, this one person who was sleeping with his mother-in-law and turn him out of the church until he repents. And then in, again in 1 Corinthians 6, he says that Christians should actually not go to secular court to settle disputes with one another, that it should be dis uh, settled between them within the bounds of the church. And then, of course, there's judgment in general. We judge who we're going to work for. We're gonna, we would judge who we might hire. Uh, there's judgment involved in what we eat for dinner, what we eat for lunch, for breakfast, well, who we marry, who our mates will be. There is a discernment that we exercise each and every day. And in fact, when you even take it on a grander scale, we have what are called the Ten Commandments. And having a commandment by its nature means that you have to judge what is right behavior by what is wrong behavior according to God's standard. So there is a such a thing as judgment in the Bible. The question becomes is, what does Jesus talking about when he says, judge not, lest you be judged? And this is where we uh, jump into the verse for today, or the verses. So as he talks, it's interesting that in our reading, uh, in the prayer book, it actually starts off with verse 36, where it says, be merciful even as your Father is merciful. And that sets, um, as I said this morning, the whole tenor of what follows. Judgment comes with mercy to some degree or another. And as Jesus starts talking about judging not, in the first couple verses, he talks about what you're not supposed to do. And he says, you're not supposed to judge lest you be judged, or condemn not lest you be condemned. Now, in those two sentences, the, ver the words are slightly different, judge and condemn. Uh, 
Judge simply means to have an opinion of someone. So let's say you work in an office with a bunch of cubicles and your cube mate decides to cook fish for lunch. Well, you could say he was rude. So there's an opinion or maybe he, you don't like people who eat fish. So there's a judgment in that sense. You have an opinion that that person is being uh, very rude to your senses and that they're bringing something to the table that you don't necessarily like and you wish that they would actually eat somewhere else. However, the word condemn has a little more serious undertone in which there's a sense of assigning guilt to somebody. So a good instance of this is throughout the New Testament we have the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the Herodians, the ruling classes of the Jewish people at the time. And you will notice like at certain places in the scriptures they will comment on how they, these types of people who they call sinners are attracted to Jesus. So we have the prostitutes, the tax collectors, those who are seen as the outcasts of society coming to Christ for his teaching and for what he offers them. And these people are labeled sinners. And the idea is there is that these Pharisees have judged that they do not belong to their group. They are not true children of Israel. They have decided to uh, take the exit from the true and narrow way. The idea here is, is that to be a Pharisee meant that you strictly observe the law, and as I mentioned this morning, there's this idea amongst the Pharisees at the time that if one man were to perfectly keep the law for one day would be the time when the Lord returned to be with his people and full. So these people were very serious about what it meant to be good and what it meant to be bad, and those people who didn't fit their definition were judged or condemned as being guilty of sin. But Jesus tells us not to take this attitude. And what he does is he dovetails that, as he does in other places in Scripture, with what God will do to us if we don't uh, judge correctly or, or judge behavior correctly. And what I'm getting at is, in one instance, in Matthew chapter 6, for instance, this is germ... Uh, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right after he goes through the Lord's Prayer, he says the following. He says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So we see in this verse there's the idea that there's a relationship between our forgiveness from God and, how, and whether or not we forgive other people. And in another place, he reiterates this, is in Matthew chapter 18. And this is the famous story of the unforgiving servant. If you remember the story, there's this master, this king, and uh, there's this servant that owes him basically, I don't know, the, the comparison is somewhat, somewhere in the neighborhood of millions of dollars in debt. And this person is never going to be able to repay it. So what the master is about to do is to throw him and his family into debtor's prison. And the man begs and he pleads, and then finally the master has mercy on him and, and frees him. But then this same man goes out and he finds a fellow servant who owes him like maybe a little less than a day's wage. And he chokes him and he starts to wrestle with him and the man begs him for mercy and he the man refuses and he throws him into debtor's prison. So a couple of his fellow servants get together and they say, hey master, look what this, what this guy did after you just showed him mercy. And then the master says, I showed you mercy and you failed to show someone else mercy. I'm going to throw you into prison. So the moral of that story, of course, being that God expects his children, if they're truly his children, to show mercy to those who they interact with. It's not simply a judgment matter, it's a judgment, but also a sense of doing it with a sense of mercy. Because as you look in the, in the verses right after verse 37, he talks about giving and it will be given to you. Forgiving and it will be forgiven you. 
there's, a, there's this mix that comes into the idea of judgment. And he says that as you're forgiven or as you forgive, you will be forgiven as well. Given, it will be given to you as well in the measure that you give out. And then he makes this illustration of this being given to you in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, and we be put into your lap. The idea here is, is in the marketplace, they would used to put wheat into containers or grain, and what they would do is they would shake the grain down into the end of the container, and that and they would continue to pour and to pour until it was overflowing, so that the person buying the grain would get what it was owed to them. And that's what Jesus is getting back here. There is an abundance that is given to his people as they exercise the same mercy that was given to them because of their sins. And then we go down to verse 39. There comes this little interlude in his discussion of judgment. Uh, it seems to pop out a little cattywampus from what his main line is, but I think there's a good case to be said that there's a lot to be said here about what he's getting at. When he talks about the idea in a parable about a blind man leading a blind man. And he says, if a blind man leads a blind man, will they not both fall into a pit? So what Jesus is getting at here is more than likely, and there's a bit difference in opinion depending on who you ask, but my thought is, is that he's talking about his adversaries, the Pharisees. Uh, bl they're blind men, basically spiritually blind, not knowing who God is, not knowing his mercy and that they go around and they're making proselytes and that these people start to follow these men and then they start taking on the same habits that they do. They start following them. Well, of course, if you follow somebody who's blind and you're blind yourself, that doesn't end up being a good day. So they both fall into a pit. The idea here is much the same thing. As he says in verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. So this is seen in everyday life. For instance, when you're a child, um, you might have said to yourself, living under your mother and father's roof, that I would never be like my father or mother in this particular instance. They did something that I didn't like, or they punished me wrong, and I would never do that to my children. Or I would never do this, or I would never do that. And then when you turn 30 and you have kids and are married, you're saying, how did I turn into my mother? Or how did I turn into my father? It's just the idea of who you hang out with, you start to take on those traits. And that's much the same here. And it's much the same in the religious circle. When you're in a church and you fall under the teaching of a certain pastor, you will tend to follow that person. You might even take on some of his temperament or, or even if it's like in a small group and you have a leader you might tend to take on the views and the attitudes of that leader. So there's a very organic process in there. And so Jesus, what he's really, I think what he's really trying to get at here is he's saying, look, if you folks follow these, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Herodians, you will become like them. And then you will judge as they judge. You will start to act as they act. And then when you come and you see somebody who is a prostitute, you see somebody who's a thief, you see somebody who's a tax collector, will you not have the same attitude towards them that they do? And by the way, this is not what I want you to do. Instead, in verses 41 all the way to the end of our passage today, he talks about an, uh, the idea of a speck being in your eye. So here's a, a picture that he shows us. And the idea, of course, is that, and we've all heard it many times, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye while you have a log in your own? The idea of a log here, if you go back, uh, interesting definition in the Greek, it's the, actually um, a log that's, or a beam that's used in building a house. It's probably like the main beam in the house. So there's this huge piece of wood that's stuck in your eye, and it blinds you but you are still good enough somehow to see the speck in somebody else's eye. And you even offer to help this person with that speck by taking it out for them. Well, this is what the Pharisees do. They are out there running around trying to say how terrible you know, sinners certain people were, but they never stopped to reflect 
on their position before God. And this is the crux of the idea of Jesus' teaching for today. He says, basically, in order to judge right, before you start going around seeing the specks in everybody else's eye, their sin, their, where they fall short, where they goof up, he says, first you need to take the log out of your own eye. And this is what is missing in much of what we see in either social media or on the news. The idea of judging not is not a big, of judging or not judging at all is not a biblical idea. It's the idea of judging without mercy is what is missing. People on social media, people on the news say sound bites, they condemn, they judge, they don't understand what other people are going through. And they don't even understand their own position before God, how they're broken, how they're sinful, how they don't measure up to the commandments that God has given us. And if people would just sit down for one minute and understand their own position before God, even as Christians, that we're broken people, that we desperately need Jesus as our Savior because there is no way we can keep the law. The judgments that we would render would be factual, but I think they would be tinged with a lot more mercy and understanding. And I say that because if you go to Galatians, Galatians 6, 1, Jesus says the following, or not Jesus, but Paul writes the following about what it means to judge and what it means to restore. He says, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. So in verse 1 of that paragraph, the idea is, is that when you catch somebody in a transgression, especially a Christian, a fellow Christian, the idea should be one of restoration to fellowship with God rather than condemnation. And it's because we're all in the same boat together. We're all broken. We all need grace from God. And he says, even in doing that, you keep watch on yourself, knowing full well that you could be in that person's shoes, maybe not right now, maybe not tomorrow, but someday you might do something that will shame you, that will possibly drive you away from God, possibly drive you away from the church. But that's not the way it's supposed to be. So the attitude that Paul Back, or illustrates here is the same as what Jesus says in Luke 6. It's the idea of judgment with soberness. Judgment with the idea of calling, calling, calling something what it is, but doing so with the idea that we could all be doing it ourselves. So this is Jesus' teaching. We are to judge, but we're not to judge without mercy. We're not to judge without understanding who we are before God, before approaching somebody else about what they're doing wrong before God. And I like a quote that Martin Luther said once when he was still around. He said that as a Christian, he was simply a beggar telling other beggars where to find bread. And it says a lot about what our attitude should be towards God and towards others. For if we find a Christian in fault, or if we found an outsider in fault, we take him to the same place. We take him to Jesus. For the Christian, that means there's restoration of fellowship with not only each other and the church, but also with God himself. And for the, for the non-Christian, there is an opportunity that we have to show that, no, we are not perfect. We are saved by the blood of Christ. We're not saved by what we do ourselves. It's impossible. And like us, you have the opportunity to lay your sins before God. Everything that you have ever done wrong, 
Lay down your brokenness, your sin, the things that keep you up at night, and bring them before Christ. That is what judgment is. Amen.